Um, hello everyone, we would like to start with this Brambach seminar. This is a special edition due to the fact that um, Dr. Gregory Ornsby is visiting Mexico this, this week and we wanted to take advantage of him visiting um, Cimet, Chapingo and the surrounding areas to come and give us a small Brambach seminar about his work. Um, and I'm going to be glad to introduce him. Uh, Mr. Gregory Ormsby is the Education and Outreach Coordinator of the Center of the Agroforestry at the University of Missouri, working with agroforestry initiatives both in the U.S. and around the world. Mr. Ormsby will talk about the role of agroforestry and its potential contribution pro for provisioning ecosystem services and enhancing food security, with some examples of corn and wheat agroforestry intercropping from around the world. The Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri, established in 1998, um, is one of the world's leading centers contributing to the science underlying agroforestry, the science and practice of intensive land use management combining trees and or shrubs with crops and or livestock. Agroforestry practices help landowners to diversify product markets and farm income, improve soil and water quality, sequester carbon, and reduce erosion, non-point source pollution, and damage due to flooding, and migrate climate change. Um, as I mentioned before, Mr. Ormsby is, is gonna be here today. He has already had some meetings with some of our CIMIT colleagues. He will be having some other meetings, so we are really glad to have this Brambach seminar that is called Agroforestry for Sustainable Resource Management and Food Security. Thanks again, Daniela, for that kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for, for joining us here. Um, thank you for having me here at, at, at CIMIT. And um, so, as Daniela mentioned, my name is Gregory Ormsby Mori. Uh, uh, I'm the outreach coordinator at the Center for Agroforestry in, at the University of Missouri. Our topic today, we're gonna to talk about agroforestry and its potential contribution to sustainable resource management and food security. Um, in this brief talk, I'd like to just try to give some perspective on how agroforestry approaches, uh, agroforestry, that is the intentional integration of trees and shrubs with crops and or livestock in sustainable land use systems, how agroforestry can contribute to, as we discussed, sustainable resource management and food security uh, in both temperate and tropical uh, regions around, around the world. Uh, we'll consider some examples uh, initially uh, uh, of both uh, some of the uh, economic uh, and environmental challenges facing agriculture uh, and, and kind of challenges to the long-term sustainability of, of, of agriculture, and then um, review uh, how agroforestry presents uh, some solutions with some specific focus on uh, U.S. agriculture. Uh, and then after re reviewing some of those examples, consider uh, examples of agroforestry, uh, particularly of kind of agroforestry, evergreen agriculture in Africa uh, and its uh, uh, contribution to uh, enhancing uh, ecosystem services and, and really uh, bolstering food security uh, in countries around Africa. And I'll, I'll, as I mentioned, I'll, I'll try to incorporate examples of, of wheat and corn intercropping as, as, as much as possible, uh, considering our, we're here today at CIMIT. Uh, but before I, I, I go into some detail on that, I, I'd just like to take one minute and maybe just talk about uh, the Center for Agroforestry and, and who we are and what we, we do. Uh, and we're uh, uh, a university-based research center at the University of Missouri uh, with a primary research focus on, on researching and testing agroforestry systems and the breeding and selection of, of tree and, and uh, shrub species for use in agroforestry systems. Uh, we have uh, some emphasis on specialty crop development and market development of specialty crops, as well as biomass. We also are, are an outreach center. We have a robust education and outreach program. We have an online master's degree program. We have uh, uh, many training uh, resources for agroforestry, including an annual academy and uh, training manuals and different modules for, for trainings that we've delivered both in the U.S. and, and around uh, the world. Um, I also uh, have a, a monthly webinar series, the Agroforestry in Action webinar series. Most of our, our materials, technical guides, training manuals are all available for download on our website, 
download on, on our website. And uh, on the final slide, I'll, I'll have the uh, URL for our website. But uh, so just uh, thought to give a little bit of background of who we are at the Center for Agroforestry and, and what we do. So uh, moving on, modern agriculture, uh, well, uh, there's been tremendous gains, tremendous advances in uh, this model of high input industrial agriculture, tremendous gains in yields, particularly over the last half century, uh, gains in yields, in efficiency, and in, in total factor productivity um, in recent decades. And as we can see in the graph here, uh, in, in Missouri, uh, corn yields uh, have steadily risen. And as presented in um, Bushel's Breaker, uh, translating that to I think volume per hectare, I'm not sure if I can do that at the top of my head here, but, but I think you get the picture that there's a, a steady you know, upward trending curve of, of yields uh, for corn in, in, in Missouri. Um, but um, you know, that productivity and those, those gains have, have come at some cost. I think we're, we're well aware of uh, some of the environmental impacts and costs, uh, whether uh, you know, soil erosion, uh, uh, use of agrochemicals, or loss of biodiversity. But, uh, and I think looking ahead, if we see uh, some projections, looking ahead, for example, in this slide, projected by 2030, that's only going to intensify. There's going to be increasing demands on uh, resources, water use, uh, energy and, and water and, and food demand are projected by 2030 to increase by another 50%, uh, with also accompanying environmental problems, biodiversity loss, uh, deforestation, and uh, and accompanying problems. So, uh, and that's only likely to intensify. So, uh, for example, here we see uh, the percentage uh, of uh, the, the percentage that agriculture occupies in, in world water use and global water withdrawal. And uh, it varies quite a bit across regions, with South Asia perhaps being the highest uh, in terms of the percentage. Uh, uh, going to agriculture in Europe, uh, the lowest. Just going to give you some examples of some of the environmental uh, uh, problems associated with, with agriculture. Uh, as uh, populations grow and there's a growing middle class, well, some of those demands are also going to increase as a growing middle class has uh, <clears throat> demanding more uh, proteins from meat and, and, and vegetable products. So uh, that projected middle class expansion is also going to put uh, increasing demands on, on the world's resources. Uh, not only questions of quantity, but uh, water quality. Here you see a map of uh, the United States, and it's really, it's, uh, the colored area is the uh, uh, Missouri, Mississippi River drainage area. And you really see the intensity of the, the nutrient loading uh, from agriculture in, in those dark red areas. That corresponds to the U.S. Corn Belt in, along the Mississippi River drainage area. So uh, that, of course, uh, you know, nitrogen and, and phosphorus coming, uh, leaking from agricultural systems, getting into waterways, uh, ending up in the Mississippi River, and eventually into the, the Gulf of Mexico in the ocean, where it's contributed to a hypoxic zone, a dead zone. Um, agriculture really forming the largest uh, share of, of uh, nutrient loading in, in those waterways. Uh, not just in the US, but around the world, there are hypoxic zones. You see in that far right corner a, quite a, a steep increase in the number of hypoxic zones over the last century. Um, there's some estimates there of soil loss uh, for, and erosion from in the Midwest, and probably it's very likely that the, the official estimates of the USDA are probably very underestimated to what is the actual soil loss. Uh, again, contributing to uh, uh, contamination of waterways and hypoxic zones around the world. Uh, you know, thickness of topsoil correlated to agricultural productivity. So if we're losing topsoil and our soil resources at those rates, that's going to present real challenges for future agricultural productivity. Uh, just briefly, I'll uh, just mention that agriculture also contributes a, a significant share to global greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, for the American farmer, there are many challenges, but we've looked at some of the environmental uh, problems or challenges associated with agriculture, but there's some real economic challenges and, and, and trends in, in for the uh, U.S. agriculture. Uh, you know, today's uh, farmer in the U.S. Uh, feeds about 126 people. That's the ratio of farmer to, to people, and uh, that's up from about 26 in 1960. So... Um, 
But there's other some worrisome trends. Is that a trend towards ever larger farms, as you can see by uh, some of the graphs here. Uh, uh, you know, many of the, whoops, some of those smaller farms are, are really are not profitable. The, the, the many, many smaller farms are really generating very low levels of revenue. The high revenue uh, class of, of farms are really uh, uh, up in the very large uh, size farms. Uh, so the trend towards larger farms, there's also a trend towards uh, older farmers. Farms are getting larger, farmers are getting older. So some, some challenges for the future uh, sustainability of, of American agriculture. So farmers are looking for ways to diversify, both because the economic uh, challenges, I mean, in, you know, with, with, if you see here some of the commodity prices of corn and soy, profitability is, is and the margins are, are sometimes very uh, challenging. Uh, so due to falling uh, commodity prices, uh, as well as due to some of the uncertainties in agriculture, especially due to uh, uh, climate uh, potential threats from climate change, and you hear some, you see that upper trend of, of of yields, but how it's uh, affected by extreme uh, climate events or weather events. And so due to economic and both environmental considerations, uh, farmers are looking for uh, opportunities to diversify their farms, um, looking for sustainable um, and cost-effective solutions, whether certainly there's solutions uh, such as no-till agriculture and cover crops. Uh, but uh, diversification can also be uh, an important component of uh, future farm sustainability in the United States. So can agroforestry be part of that solution? Well, yes, we think, yes, it can. Um, agroforesters, well, we think we know, and because we have some good data to show, uh, and we believe it's really time to uh, take agroforestry to the mainstream and, and really ramp up adoption uh, throughout U.S. agriculture uh, so that a landscape like this might, a farming landscape like this might begin to look something uh, like this with uh, a range of agroforestry practices integrated across the landscape from, from short rotation woody biomass to riparian buffers, windbreaks, alley cropping, civil pasture, some of the main agroforestry practices that we work with in, in the United States. Of course, across the globe, there's maybe perhaps a much wider range of different types of agroforestry practices. But uh, diversification and, and through agroforestry is, is uh, 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 an approach to help address some of those economic and, and environmental challenges in, in our agriculture production systems. So what is the current extent of, of agroforestry in the United States uh, today? Well, not as much as we would hope after uh, uh, some decades of, of effort and research and outreach in agroforestry. Uh, of the total land uh, base of you know, 300 million hectares in, in forest, about 180 or so in farmland, etc., and pastures. Agroforestry, uh, at the very wide estimate, would be about 57 million hectares, but that would be including what we call grazed woodlands, which, if not well managed, it's, it's not really the, the most optimal uh, land use uh, or agroforestry approach. So removing uh, grazed forests, Really, we're left with about maybe three million hectares across the United States that are actually in some kind of agroforestry practice. Well, we would hope to uh, achieve more adoption and, and, and more uh, widespread uh, application of agroforestry across the landscape. Uh, just to give you some examples of where agroforestry uh, uh, practices have provided uh, uh, solutions and, and, and options for, for farmers. Uh, if some of you may recall the Dust Bowl of the 1930s or have heard about uh, that uh, catastrophic in environmental uh, uh, situation in the 1930s, well, one of the responses was, was a, a very uh, significant or a sizable uh, campaign to plant trees in, 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 in shelter belts or windbreaks across the uh, American and Canadian Great Plains, uh, something on the order of uh, I mean, 186,000 miles of, of windbreaks and shelter belts were planted to protect uh, agricultural lands in, in the Great Plains, which were very susceptible to uh, wind damage and wind erosion. Uh, so they're, they're very effective in, in protecting uh, reducing wind er erosion, but also protecting crops from high wind events, and, and that can be uh, can reduce yields. Uh, in the state of Nebraska, there's some example of, of some of the uh, coverage of, of windbreaks. There's an image that shows us what a farm with windbreaks might look like. But there's also many additional benefits to the windbreaks in addition to uh, 
to, to yield protection, uh, including uh, biodiversity or potentially harvestable products from those uh, windbreaks. Just to give you uh, an example here, here's um, some, some previous research from, from John Court in, in the uh, uh, late 1980s that shows how a windbreak uh, functions, how it, it um, is protecting crops far into the field. You know, we might see a, a slight reduction in yield just inside of the, 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 the tree buffer where you see the red area there. But as we move into the field of, of sometimes between 8 to 10 or up to 12 tree heights into the field, there's significant protection and boost of crop yield from the windbreak's ability to slow down and, and disperse the wind energy. Uh, that's just an example of how uh, windbreaks uh, or an agroforestry practice uh, is, can uh, realize significant benefits in, in, an, in an agricultural uh, setting. Uh, another, alley cropping. Um, alley cropping with intercropping wheat or corn uh, with, with tree crops. Uh, these are some successful examples from the United States. In the lower uh, left, we have a, a soy pecan uh, cropping system. And in the right, it's a corn or maize, we say corn in the United States, <laughs> uh, a maize uh, walnut system. Uh, but the upper, upper images are, are showing us a, a winter wheat and ch Chinese chestnut uh, farm that's in Missouri. And that farmer's been very successful with that system. Uh, he's a farmer who, who previously was, was a, a row crop farmer, uh, farming on perhaps 1,500 no, or more acres of, of a corn soy rotation. But uh, that became an increasingly tough uh, game for him in trying to, and his, his doubts about the future sustainability or profitability of that, he, he wanted to look for other, other options. And so he's farming now on a much smaller uh, piece of ground with this, uh, he started out with a chestnut corn rotation, but he shifted as, as the trees have, have come up to a chestnut with, with wheat and, and chestnut with squash. So this is chestnut with winter wheat, and he's been very successful at it. And uh, the, the chestnuts alone provide a, a significant income of thousands of dollars per acre. And he's integrated that with some other crops like elderberry. So it, it's a really an excellent example of how uh, an, a, a grain alley cropping system can work um, and be profitable, in addition to some of the ecosystem benefits that would come from having trees on, on the landscape. Uh, moving on, here's some other examples of uh, wheat intercropping from around the world. This is Paulonia uh, with wheat in, in China. I think there's an estimated about 8 million acres of this type of system across China. <clears throat> We have here uh, wheat uh, intercrop with walnut in, in France. Just wanted to show you some images, some examples of elsewhere in the world. Um, but getting back to farm diversification, um, farm diversification can, can help farms to be more resilient and also more competitive. If you notice some of the uh, returns per acre of some of these specialty crops, when we're the chestnut, uh, as I mentioned, very, can be very profitable, um, pecan, and, and also our elderberry, it's a native uh, uh, fruit, and uh, it can be intercropped or serve as uh, uh, hedgerows al along uh, crop fields and, and, and provide a lot of ecosystem benefits in terms of soil and pollinator habitat. And it's also a harvestable uh, uh, and, and can get some significant incomes as that market develops. I should mention that, um, again, the specialty crop development has been a particular focus of our center, pecans, walnut, elderberry, and some other native fruits. Uh, both the research going into the, the, the breeding and selection of improved cultivars, which has been greatly enhanced by advances in some of the genomic techniques, but also uh, on the economic side, uh, the business planning, the market development side for really growing some of these industries in our region, the elderberry and the chestnut industry. So I wanted to show you some examples of, of that and, and reinforce how farm diversification can be uh, beneficial. Uh, another uh, type of, of agroforestry practice, uh, civil pasture, where we're integrating trees, forages, and livestock in, an, in, a, in a managed uh, system, has a tremendous benefit for improving animal welfare. The shade uh, uh, and shelter provided by the trees really in, is important for animal welfare, reducing heat stress and wind chill. But also, the bottom line, the productivity, the enhanced productivity, translates into improved profits. And, and, uh, um, the, the graph to the left is showing uh, just a direct correlation. That's uh, uh, milk production uh, uh, against what's THI or the temperature humidity index. And you see as the tem temperature humidity index, that's a function of both temperature and humidity. As that goes up, there's you know, direct reduction in, in production, in this case milk production, but also affects, uh, has uh, effects in the cattle industry. I mean, 
significant losses across the United States in both the dairy and the cattle industry in the tune of billions of dollars due to heat stress or wind chill in the wintertime in our cold months. Uh, so, uh, oops, I went the wrong way there. So, less stress, more money. As if we can reduce the amount of stress from heat stress and, and, and wind chill, we get better productivity, we're going to get better, better returns. And here's some examples of, of some of the uh, observed economic benefits or production benefits from civil pasture in both dairy and, and cattle industry. So I mentioned in, in our situation, say cow-calf operations in the United States, uh, where they're doing winter calving in February, there can be um, significant impact from, from the wind chill, winter winds on, on calving rates, calving success, and, and weaning weights. So having just a little bit of shelter for some trees can, can have, have a significant benefit. Uh, moving on, oh, I should also mention that it's not just uh, uh, immediate uh, impacts to the animal welfare and, and, and performance, but in the silver pastures are also going to help us in our, in our forage production. Uh, we're going to see, for example, the, the upper graph there it shows just how uh, the shade in the civil pasture can really help uh, give a much better distribution of forest resource, forage resources across the season. We have a, 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 a much less of a slump in the hot summer months where many uh, conventional open pastures are going to start shutting down in, in the hot weather. We get a bit of uh, production boost, but you're also seeing season extension in both the cool spring and, and the cool fall season. So an overall better forage distribution, and that's going to lead to, to better, better, better grazing and, and better performance. But also in, in, in forage quality and forage quantity, you see these graphs here. Um, it may be hard to see, but there's a number, it's about 12 different species of cool season and warm season grasses and legumes, uh, and almost Uniformly, you see a kind of you know, sweet spot there around the 45% shade level where nearly all of the cool season, warm season legumes and grasses, there's about 20 uh, in all tested, are getting their optimal production right around 45% shade. So silver pasture can also enhance uh, forage quality and quantity. Uh, moving on, uh, another example of an agroforestry practice, uh, especially in, 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 in corn soy rotation systems in the American Midwest that can have a huge uh, benefit uh, environmentally is, is what we call riparian forest buffers, where we're creating a buffer area around stream, rivers, or riparian areas to reduce sediment uh, loss and also re reduce this, the nutrient leakage, to reduce the sediment loading into those waterways. So uh, the, the image down below showing uh, a, a schematic of what a well-constructed uh, riparian buffer might look like. Uh, wider is, of course, better, uh, but you see this three-tiered system where we have trees, maybe native trees or other, some other kind of productive tree that could produce biomass or some harvestable pr product trees, shrubs, and, and, a, and a grass strip that might be native switchgrass or some other grass that can be harvested for biomass. So a well-constructed and well-managed um, riparian buffer strip to the edge of, of the, the, the uh, crop field, in this case corn, has, as you can see from the numbers, significant reduction in nutrient loading, the amount of nitrogen phosphorus escaping the system and, and getting into the groundwater or, or the um, uh, uh, waterways, surface waterways. Uh, when we have this kind of riparian buffers and diversification, uh, it also helps in, in sort of major flood events like this. Uh, there's been some research that's shown that the, some of the levees uh, are protected by these, slowing down the force of the water from, from flood events. Uh, I think I mentioned in the previous slide that, that to the extent we can design these systems to also have some harvestable products in addition to the ecosystem services, the environmental benefits, we can get some additional income for the farmers from them. Whoops, I'm moving in the wrong direction, sorry. Okay, so uh, I mentioned previously uh, some of the agrochemicals. I mean, in our agricultural systems, we use herbicides, pesticides, there's, there's, there's the fertilizers. But there's also a significant amount of use of veterinary antibiotics. In fact, I think the total amount of antibiotic use in the animal livestock sector in the United States is probably much greater than that used by humans. And so, unfortunately, uh, the vast majority of that ends up going out the back end of the, of the animal and, and, and deposited in pastures and, and, and feeding lots. So, um, riparian forest buffers can also play a very significant role in reducing the amount of 
veterinary antibiotics escaping those systems into surface or, or, or groundwater. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So in, in fact, some of the research we've done with uh, cottonwood and poplar and grass buffers on the edge of pastures has shown a significant degradation uh, of the veterinary antibiotics. So uh, if you see here, uh, greatly uh, the red line showing a, a, a significant acceleration of the deg biodegradation in the root zone of some of those veterinary antibiotics. So another example of uh, uh, very effective uh, use of agroforestry systems, uh, agroforestry applications in agricultural systems to, um, for significant environmental benefit. Um, We've all heard, you know, the debate and the discussion on, on global greenhouse gas emissions, and I think you notice from this slide that some of the estimates show agroforestry as being the, the land use approach that has the, the greatest potential for carbon sequestration. Um, just moving quickly, not spending too much time on this, but there's some of the estimates of the potential of agroforestry to enhance carbon storage in, in either marginal pasture or cropland across the United States. Uh, here's some estimates of you know, the, 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 the amounts of, of potential carbon sequestration um, through uh, applying, uh, I think, uh, if, if another million acres, hectares of, of agroforestry systems were implemented, how much uh, uh, carbon sequestration we might, might um, be able to see. Uh, and globally, yeah, agroforestry can, can, can offset a significant amount of, of the... Uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so just a, a snapshot of some of the environmental concerns and, and potential for agroforestry to uh, m mitigate uh, some of the environmental uh, problems from our agricultural systems. Uh, other ways of, of, uh, for us to get uh, more uh, trees on farms um, for all the uh, benefits that it can provide. I'm gonna move quickly through some of those slides in the interest of time so we can maybe get on to some of the other examples. So forgive me if I move a little, skip so, some of these slides. Um, I did mention the potential for riparian buffers and other agroforestry systems to also produce uh, harvestable crops. In this case, uh, the potential for riparian forest buffers to also be producing uh, biomass for, 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 for renewable energy. Uh, and just, you know, if, if we think about those riparian buffers and, and uh, their role, in, let's say if we have a setting like this uh, with a, a riparian area and areas of forest around, if we uh, begin adding a riparian forest buffer like that, it can play a huge role in, in providing habitat, habitat and enhancing biodiversity by having that, that sort of connectivity, that corridor where many species will, will really need to have a sufficient uh, area uh, for, uh, for a viable population and, and gene pool. Uh, so riparian forest buffers are important uh, you know, in many ways and deliver a lot of uh, ecosystem benefit, including for, for pollinators around our, our, our agricultural fields. So uh, just in summary, in the United States, uh, here's a quote from a former Secretary of Agriculture. You know, we, we really should be supporting uh, agroforestry and, and promoting increased adoption of agroforestry across our agricultural landscapes because, landscapes because of the uh, uh, proven economic and, and environmental benefits that, that uh, agroforestry can provide. But of course, we have a lot of work uh, to do, both in the research and the outreach uh, side. Um, but, so. Uh, Wanted to share with you just some perspectives from, from U.S. agriculture. And um, so moving on, I'd like to maybe, maybe turn our attention now and uh, look at some examples of agroforestry um, in other parts of the world, and particularly uh, one type of agroforestry in Africa that's being called evergreen agriculture, and how it, it has played a very important role in major transformation, land uh, restoration off across uh, a significant uh, parts of uh, sub-Saharan Africa and has tremendous potential for enhancing uh, sustainable uh, resource uh, management and food security uh, throughout Africa. Um, I think we're familiar, most of us are familiar with the, the paradigm of uh, low productivity uh, land degradation, poverty in, in for many <clears throat> kind of the, the nexus of land degradation, low productivity, and poverty, uh, kind of a 
cycle uh, uh, in, in, in much, fa you know, facing many uh, uh, small holder farmers in Africa. Uh, there's been, as this graph shows, areas of, of tremendous land degradation in, in some parts of Africa. You see, you see the intense red areas. Uh, in addition to that, there's, uh, you know, it's quite concerning that uh, the tremendous disparities that exist between, say, uh, within countries and, and across the world. For example, farmer incomes in the United Kingdom, where this image is from, I mean, the average income for a farmer in the United Kingdom is $60,000, and I think for the general population it's about $44,000. Uh, comparing that to the vast parts of the world where a um, huge percentage of the populations uh, are, are, are learning, earning or living on less than $1.25 a day. So uh, some parts of Africa, over 70% of the population uh, on, on less than $1.25 a day. So uh, these are pervasive, uh, uh, enduring disparities that are also of a major concern. And part of this uh, paradigm of uh, a downward cycle of, of poverty and land degradation. So how do we shift from a uh, paradigm of this downward spiral of poverty and land degradation, degradation and to an upward spiral of land restoration, enhanced livelihoods. So I think, uh, I'm hoping that you'll see, as I do in the following slides, a land use approach that, that offers quite a bit of potential to turn this uh, paradigm around to, to an upward cycle of, of enhanced livelihoods and, and land restoration. So reversing that paradigm, well, I mean, in the current paradigm, there's a huge percentage of the land that's either degraded or highly degraded and only small amounts in, in agroforestry or civil pasture and increasing pressures on, on forest resources and, and forest deforestation. But if we could move towards a paradigm of climate start agriculture, agroforestry, and, and reforestation, uh, so those are our challenges to, uh, I think I'll just uh, move ahead and keep uh, moving through some of these slides uh, uh, in the interest of time. But one example uh, is the tremendous re uh, transformation, what we call the Parkland Renaissance, that's occurred in some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, and particularly in, in, in Niger, uh, or Niger, um, and particularly with the use of, of some of these fertilizer trees and shrubs, or, um, and an approach that's increasingly being called evergreen agriculture. Uh, this is an aerial view of, of what that might look like, whereas uh, decades before that, that did not look like this. It was a much uh, area affected by uh, increased desertification. And so with, the, with what's been described as a process of farmer-led natural regeneration, where they've shepherded uh, from the natural seed bank uh, or, or, or rootstock, the regeneration of, of millions of trees across this landscape, and in particular, one species, the Phytherbia albida, which we'll see uh, in a bit, uh, uh, has some special characteristics that really is a tremendous uh, asset in, in, in transforming the, these, uh, these landscapes into productive uh, landscapes. Um, and that's been scaled up across uh, many millions of hectares in, in some of these countries. Uh, so types of agroforestry in, in, that we may see in, in Africa, here are some types. I think we're just going to focus on, on, on the final one, the evergreen agriculture, which is the intercropping of, of field crops with trees or, or, or shrubs. So uh, again, uh, more detail on, on well, what are we talking about with evergreen agricultural systems, uh, integrating trees and crops with, uh, with livestock in product uh, systems. So um, some of the types of evergreen agriculture, I just, just talked a little bit about farmer-managed natural regeneration. Uh, this is also what could be described as conservation agriculture with trees, where we're practicing some of the reduced tillage, but, but also introducing some trees or, or shrubs into the system. And here's an, uh, an image of what that might look like. Uh, but we get some, some, some benefits from the, the reduced tillage, but the, the trees are also providing uh, a number of benefits and, and that are enhancing uh, the, the, the crop production, but also uh, things like increased carbon sequestration in, in this system. Some of the types of trees that are being used in evergreen agriculture are, are detailed here. Some of them are, are 
say, fruit or, or timber species, uh, providing direct uh, harvestable benefits, whether it's fruit, timber, or oil, oil crops. But a number of trees that are indirectly providing benefits as fertilizer trees, as I mentioned, or, or, or fodder trees or shrubs and some of the species mentioned there, such as Phytherbia or Glittercidia. And here's a, an image of what a Phytherbia albida tree looks like the, and, and a landscape with Phytherbia albida on it. Um, and the particular characteristics of the Phytherbia albida, some of you may be familiar with, is it has a phenomenon called reverse phenology. Right? So if you notice, in, in uh, the dry season and the wet season, so here in, in the dry season, the Phytherbia albida is, is leafing out. And this is a period after the, 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 the maize harvest. And, and, but as we move into the wet season and uh, after the planting season and, and the, uh, the, the core uh, maize growing season, Phytherbia albida sheds its leaves. So it's an ideal combination with, with, with maize in a system like this. And you notice that in the Glercidia is also inter, in, interspersed in that Glercidia. It might be coppiced for either fodder or coppiced for, 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 for a mulch in, in the system. So there's, there's a improved nutrient cycling, a nu improved nutrient availability with the, the nitrogen fixing of, of these species. And some of the microclimates provided by those trees enhancing soil moisture and, and, and a range of, of, of factors that are leading to increased yields and productivity. So for example, here uh, we have a graph of some, some measurements of, of maize yields in Zambia under Phytherbia albida. Um, <clears throat> and so in compared to yields from outside the, uh, the canopies of, of mature Phytherbia albida, and you can see it's a pretty me a significant and measurable difference um, in, in terms of kilograms per hectare. And this again was an example from Zambia uh, in, in a system with, uh, in, in trials here, uh, with Glercidia. Uh, so it was a, a trial with corn, continuous corn cultivation, or maize cultivation, sorry. Uh, in, in, in trials uh, without any additional fertilizer compared to continuous corn uh, cultivation uh, with the Glercidia, so the, the, the fertilizer shrub. And as you can see, there's a pretty clear upward you know, uh, trend for the, the yields in, in the Glercidia system and, and a downward trend of yields over 12 years with the uh, continuous cropping of maize without fertilizer trees. So again, uh, an example of, of, of how uh, adding these uh, fertilizer trees and shrubs can, can enhance yields and productivity. Here's some comparisons of, of different systems uh, in some, some plots in, in, in yields of tons per hectare uh, from maize alone to maize with both the fertilizer trees and additional chemical fertilizer. So I think where we can use the fertilizer trees and then use strategic and, and limited use of fertilizers, we can really see some, some, some gains in, in yields. Uh, this is uh, an image of a maize field with uh, some of the Glercidia. Uh, and this, this being from Zambia, you can see uh, maize alone on the left uh, without the fertilizer trees, and being is, is showing some effects of, of uh, water scarcity. Or um, in on the right side, there's um, a better performance with the Phytherbia and, and the Glercidia, both in terms of the nutrient availability and, and soil moisture availability. So that's uh, an image of some uh, ma in Malawi with some maize land with with the fertilizer trees. I uh, wanted to shift now and, and maybe uh, talk about some examples of, of wheat, wheat intercropping with, with fertilizer trees in an in, in evergreen agriculture approach. This uh, example, some trials, actually cement trials from Ethiopia, uh, where uh, some of the preliminary results, uh, this is some recently re released uh, results, so preliminary results showing the important factors for the wheat is, that, is, a, is a lower uh, temperature under, under the canopy of the tree and increased soil moisture, as well as uh, up to 30, 35% greater available nitrogen in, in, in the zone, in the tree zone. So uh, some of the trials are showing higher stover and higher, higher, higher grain yields under the canopy. Um, uh, that reference for that is, is, is here, this study, um, and I can share with that with uh, anyone. Uh, it's available through, through that link. You can read 
more about that, those trials that are some of the results just coming out. But uh, earlier um, uh, work uh, just showing some of the climatic or the temperature variation under the, uh, the canopy of the, the Fight Herbie Alveda. Um, both, so as we move in the course of a day, you see the, 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 the temperature spike outside the canopy and sort of the uh, microclimate or the mitigated midday temperature under the canopy. And so that that's can be important for, um, for, uh, for, the, for the wheat. Uh, this, is, um, this is more a, a modeling uh, of what the expected yields in dry matter would be uh, based on some of those results uh, at, at certain radiuses out uh, from uh, one meter, f four meter, and seven meters out from the tree canopy. Just uh, the final uh, column you can't quite see, but it's, uh, if you notice the lines, it's obviously as we move out to seven meters, it's, it's slightly, slightly less. But anyway, some, some examples, this is a study from 2013, again, uh, Fyherbia and, and wheat in, in Ethiopia. So, what would be the impact if across Africa, you know, millions of, of, of smallholder farmers had access to fertilizer trees on a, on a much larger scale? So, uh, here are some estimates of what some of the benefits might be if, if on an additional one million hectares we were to implement evergreen agriculture with fertilizer trees uh, and shrubs. And uh, as you can see, increased uh, yields and, uh, and benefits from uh, the, the nitrogen produced by, by those trees. Um, and so a bottom line of, of some additional, you know, approximately $160 per farm or per, uh, um, well, that's significant. Uh, if we're recalling a paradigm of, of uh, percentage of, of smallholder farmers in some of those countries having incomes of, of, of less than $1.25 a day. Um, so there is a, what's called the Evergreen Agriculture Partnership, and, and it's focused on, on scaling up this kind of uh, evergreen agriculture approach between farmer-managed natural regeneration, and conservation agriculture with fertilizer trees, and and the potential or the, that uh, that it can bring in terms of improved yields, as well as um, overall better uh, environmental outcomes, and I think ultimately quality of life. So here you can see there's about 17 countries who have already made commitments uh, with the Evergreen Agriculture Partnership um, in terms of what what kind of agri-green agriculture might be taking place, and and commitments of up to implementation of up to 40 million hectares. So I mentioned the Evergreen Agriculture Partnership. It's a growing partnership between core group of researchers and, and institutional partners, governments, donors, as you can see here. Uh, there is a website. I encourage you to take a look at the Evergreen Agriculture Partnership and, and, and some of the uh, uh, ongoing activities and proposed uh, or maybe some ambitious, but, but projections uh, for achieving restoration across millions of hectares in, in Africa. There's also a, a similar uh, initiative, the AF, F, FR100, again, proposing to achieve uh, land restoration across mil 100 million hectares. Just thought I'd show you these examples of, uh, examples of ongoing uh, initiatives for land restoration in Africa. So in, in conclusion, I think I'll, I'll wrap up here, um, but um, in conclusion, I hope I've uh, demonstrated for you that um, agroforestry in its various uh, approaches um, is our forms of land use that uh, provide significant economic and environmental benefits. Um, and um, of course, there's much work left to be done, both in the research uh, and, and the outreach. So there's a need for to support continued expanded research, education, and outreach on, on agroforestry. And um, moving forward to make agroforestry a mainstream land use practice, practice widely across our landscapes. And for, well, all, all the reasons uh, and all the benefits that it can provide, both uh, in terms of productivity, um, enhancing ecosystem services, you know, overall s economic environmental sustainability of our systems, and I think uh, 
overall quality of life for, for, for farmers and, and rural communities. I think, um, I think I'll stop there. Uh, um, and, uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, but uh, so, okay. Oh. Thank you for, um, I suppose, do we have time for if there's questions or discussions or, yeah, oh, let me, so, um, you know, there's my email and, and, and our center's uh, website. As I mentioned, our technical guides or manuals and a lot of our training materials, uh, some of them, uh, it's like our agroforestry design and planning handbook is quite adaptable. Uh, and those are, nearly all of them are available for free download off of our website, as, as well as access to our webinar series and uh, other, other resources. So thank you very much for participating today. También es en español. En español. Hello, my name is Carolina Camacho. I'm working in the socioeconomic program. Thank you for your presentation. It was very broad. I was wondering that um, because I, I have been listening in Europe that they are having for for this combination of agroforestry systems to pay them for keeping, for related with environmental services and at the same time keeping the cultural landscapes. So mm. for instance, when I was in UK, there was all, all this issue about keeping the countryside and keeping the countryside was keeping some trees, specific trees like the willow that was like important for the willow. I have been listening also in Czech Republic that they have all this idea of keeping the landscape of what was. And I have been wondering if in the States you are also considering that ledger of what agroforestry brings to keep the cultural landscape and the environmental services that, well, you talk a little bit about the environmental services, but I don't know if there is like a really movement into keeping cultural landscapes. Yeah, I, I, that's that's a really good question. I'm glad you you asked that, Dr. Camacho. Uh, and you you yeah, you cited an excellent example in in Europe, especially in I mean, tremendous progress in the last couple of years. Uh, they've they've formed a European Agroforestry Association. They've made a lot of progress. There's an excellent research network, but they also have uh, been successful in securing funding you know, through the European Union and having a you know, official representation in sort of the policy forma formulation process and, and a rapporteur, you know, providing recommendations on, on agroforestry approaches. But that particular example that you mentioned, yeah, Europe has, it, it's, it's uh, I think that's great. Um, you mentioned the examples from the UK and especially in France, but also in Spain, you know, some of the supports to, to ensure that some of the traditional civil pastoral uh, systems, the dehesa or the, the, the seasonal movements of, of, the, of the borregos. Uh, uh, and these are sort of deeply rooted cultural practices, uh, uh, especially the dehesa. And I wish I could say that, uh, you know, there's similar uh, support and resources to uh, do exactly or similar to that in the United States. I mean, yes, we, you know, I didn't really mention some of that in this talk, but you know we feel that agroforestry is also especially uh, uh, especially important in, in making possible uh, the viability of rural communities. I mean, in, in our farming communities, if our farming communities are dying out. I mean, there's there's just it's increasingly difficult for small farms and farming families to continue. The farms are a trend towards expanding bigger farms or, or corporate farms. And we have many communities in, in, in the American Midwest are just not viable communities anymore. People people don't live there. There's, there's no jobs. There's no, it's, and so if smallholder uh, agroforestry, uh, say in the developing world, uh, can you know, be the difference uh, for the smallholder in, in terms of uh, incomes and, and, and sustainability, um, we feel there's 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 also opportunities for uh, agroforestry. I was, I was mentioning, for example, the the specialty crops like the chestnuts and elderberries, where small farms uh, can can have a viable income from some of these niche or specialty markets. Um, and we we also work with quite a bit with what's called forest farming, and there's uh, traditions of harvesting medicinal botanical plants for, from from the forest, and and some of these are are, are you know, traditional cultural practices, and, and so 
preserving uh, the viability of some of those practices and, and market development, we're, we're working with uh, what we would call a, a shift from wild harvesting to uh, um, different forms of managed cultivations. One for the, uh, the conservation of some of these overharvested endangered species, but also to, to develop markets and, and make this uh, an attractive proposition for small farmers, many of them who have woods under their management or woodlots. So um, I don't really have, a, a, I wish I had a, a, a seat to and, and could provide a, a, the kind of programs and policies, answers to that questions in the United States. And, and no, I think we're, 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 we're lacking that um, sufficient support for, for the kind of things that you mentioned. So a lot of the problems you mentioned for Africa, like uh, water stress, heat stress, soil degradation, low fertility, there are also problems here in Mexico. So mm -hmm. could we take the example from Africa and implement it in Mexico, or would we need to completely do the investigation again to try to implement the same techniques in, in Mexico? That's a, uh, again, good question. Um, I, if I, as I look around the room, I'm kind of guessing that there's a, a lot more experienced and <laughs> uh, practitioners and researchers here who would be able to address that question. Uh, I, mean, I think there's obviously some of these approaches, uh, fertilizer trees, uh, fodder shrubs, intercropping, I mean, there are approaches and techniques that are not only applicable, but already being practiced in, in many parts of Mexico. I mean, I think I'm, I'm not fully aware, but I think there's some ongoing trials with fruit trees and grain intercropping in, in southern Mexico, some cement trials. Uh, there's just a vast array of, of traditional agroforestry practices here in, in Mexico from, uh, um, I mean, um, um, Help me, help me with some of the, the like metake, okay, like the metepake, or like the agave, uh, cevada intercropping in terrazas, yeah. And so, um, I think there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's a tremendous opportunity for enhancing uh, agroforestry adoption and applications across Mexico, especially things like the intensive civil pasture. I mean, this is something that's made a huge difference. Uh, the the research and development of civil pasture, in, systems intensive civil pastoriles. You know, the work from Katia and Sipav in Colombia, but, but there's also a group in Michoacan and Yucatan that are working intensely on that. I mean, it's the difference between just l l extremely low productivity, environmentally destructive, or almost non-viable extensive pasturing to highly productive, uh, intensive, uh, high productivity, and, and e much more ecologically sound systems, the intensive civil pasture. So. Um, the specifically that the approaches with the evergreen agriculture that I was referencing uh, in Africa, I, I think there's probably comparable species that that are are useful here. Whether it's some of your uh, native uh, nitrogen fixing trees and shrubs, or um, I suppose Inifap and others like in Chapingo or other uh, researchers are, are working on these kind of systems in Mexico. Um, I would hope that CIMIT and researchers at CIMIT would be interested in. And I hope that I've provided some compelling evidence, if not uh, um, at least uh, persuasive uh, <laughs> storytelling about the potential of agroforestry. And I'd hope that uh, CIMIT would, uh, I, I know there's some ongoing trials and, and I referenced the CIMIT trials in Ethiopia, but uh, I would hope that there's interest here in Mexico for, yeah. Yeah, Oaxaca mm, hop. Hmm. are working on, on, on the MIAF system. The MIAF, yeah, okay. And there's also um, some... Milpa intercalada. Inter intercalada con arboles frutales. Eso es. <laughs> sí. And there's also some experience in Guatemala, ah. also in a scheme of co-innovation with farmers, in farmers' plots, with MIAF system, mainly. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I'm actually have the good fortune, uh, next week I'm going to, have been invited to participate in the first, it's the inaugural meeting of the Red Sam, the Red temática de sistemas agroforestales mexicanos en La Paz. So I'm really excited to be there and participate and uh, I hope to learn about a lot of the ongoing and, and, and proposed agroforestry research that's, 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 that's happening. So it's, it's a, a newly formed uh, scientific network for pr uh, enhancing uh, research and uh, investigación with um, 
civil pasture system. So if you're not aware of it, I can happy to share with you uh, the links to the folks, uh, the organizers of the Red, Red Sam, uh, so uh, thematic network for agroforestry in Mexico. Yeah, my name is Carolina and I have two questions. The mm. first one is related with your slide about uh, the special crops mm. and because I, I read Pecan and it's like, I don't remember, $8,000 per oh, hectare. I think the pecan was lower. It was the chestnut. The which, chestnut. Yeah. Pecan, yeah. you know, actually pecan, it's kind of hard to really call it a specialty crop anymore. It's really increasingly, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, acreage in, in pecans. And so, but, but anyway, go oh. ahead. Yeah. yeah, my question is more about uh, how much surface, how many trees do you need to, because... Oh, the density? The uh, density. You know, or, uh, yeah, that that's going to vary whether you're in an alley cropping or a, or a civil pasture system but I think if it was just uh, in the pecan I'm, I'm uh, um, I'd have to refer to the, the to some of the literature but I'm thinking 150 trees but I, I have to uh, let's let's follow up on that and get yeah, no, some because of the maybe will be very interesting for Mexicans that mm -hmm. is a crop that they know included in their own like a border or something well, like that some of the most of the biggest areas of pecan production in the world are in fact in Chihuahua in in, in Mexico no? and so um, and that's that's not really agroforest. That's that's huge plantation pecan. Uh, so I don't think there's really much intercropping with with those systems in Chihuahua. Is anyone familiar with the pecan growing areas of Chihuahua? I've, I've never visited there myself, but uh, I, I I'd be happy to follow up and, and we find some of the uh, the studies and the technical guides on. Cause we do have on our website some planting and propagation guides for pecan and it would it would discuss some of the some of the densities and my other question was about the riparian area because forestry needs a lot of water so nowadays that the water is scarce mm. uh, have i don't know how much hectares or area uh, only for forestry is a lot of uh, use of they need mm. a lot of water, so I don't know if there are studies regarding of that. Right. Because in in California, they say completely the contrary. <laughs> they yeah, have take to the cut, out, so yeah. take out. <laughs> right, yeah, no, and that's that's a valid point. And so I'm of course citing examples in the American wood, Midwest in the Corn Belt and riparian buffers as as an approach to address the problems of, of you know nutrient loading and and and, and uh, nitrogen leaking from the system. So. It, uh, if if um, competition for water resources from a riparian buffer would adversely affect the crop, well, that's going to be uh, you know a serious issue, and, and you know farmers are just not going to be interested. Um, and so I suppose uh, you know we'd have to say uh, inclined towards you know the, the the right practice for the right setting. I mean, a semi-arid California, uh, some of the irrigated uh, agriculture there, as opposed to um, Areas in the Great Plains or uh, the American uh, Corn Belt, of course, uh, you know, different different situation in terms of precipitation and and, and yeah. uh, I'm, I just wanted to follow up just on um, on your question about you know the applicability of some of the evergreen agriculture examples I cited from Africa to Mexico, and I'm not sure uh, uh, about Fidherbia albida whether it's been proposed or, or tried here in Mexico or propagated or whether it's you know, viable here in different parts of Mexico. I've, I've seen it growing on one research farm in Florida, um, but Glercidia certainly I think you use quite widely in, in Mexico along with numerous other uh, f fertilizer, nitrogen fixing and, and fodder shrubs. Yeah. So sorry, I, I, I cut you off, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'd like to follow up on that. Um, it, obviously depends on the species. There are mm. species that are not that water, right. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that not that thirsty. Uh, if you look at the Sahel region in West Africa, um, let's say 40 years ago, it was becoming, almost beca becoming, de uh, right. de desertifying really right. rapidly. Mm. Then uh, there were a number of interventions um, uh, development interventions uh, aimed at uh, stopping that, uh, including uh, agroforestry. Mm -hmm. And that basically took off on its own after the projects left. And if you look at aerial photographs, 
uh, over time, you see then a mm -hmm. steady increase in the number of trees uh, in that area because the farmers uh, uh, find it find it useful mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, well, those are trees that are not thirsty, uh, mm, yeah, and, so uh, that's very important, and they yeah. actually inhabit. Uh, uh, there is the acacia alba is one yeah. of the trees that is that's being used there, uh, which fixes nitrogen. So there is uh, there is lots of benefits. Now it, that's the real the real key to it is that you either have to have a system which provides direct benefits to uh, to the small smallholders. Uh, otherwise, it, for them, it's not going to. They have a. They have a relative. It, 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 as a scientist, you may be looking across a time span of, let's say, 20, 30 years, and saying, "Well, we really need to do this because <laughs> our future, uh, our future is at stake." For a farmer, they can look. They can look ahead maybe four or five years in terms of g uh, getting return on their uh, investments. Uh, if not, yeah, it's, it's, tough. it's not going to happen. 10, 20, 30 year horizon. But, yeah, or, and it's not even it's not even smallholders. You know, yeah. You're talking oh, about in the United States, in, yeah, exactly. exactly. And that's uh, why that's why it's working in in uh, in Europe uh, uh, much more than in the U.S. Mm -hmm. because agricultural subsidies in Europe are linked to agro environmental schemes. Right. You don't you know you don't get agricultural subsidies per se just like that income support it is tied to these kind of these kind of these kind of things so farmers are looking for ways that they can actually you know uh, uh, do stuff which uh, w which uh, they get paid for to do yeah. yeah that's exactly right and i mean following up i mean the right species you know the right tree in the right place the right system for the right uh, landscape and setting um, yeah, the, the phenomena in Africa, really, it, it, exactly, it's, that's what description, farmer-led uh, managed natural regeneration. So it really was uh, by the efforts of millions of small farmers that, that this transformation occurred. I mean, granted, as you mentioned, there was some early interventions with, it was what, like, some of the efforts to put, like, rock barriers to help slow down uh, and increase infiltration, but, and some of the agroforestry species, but... From there, it was it was all farm farmer led, and then there's a whole another uh, area of agroforestry work in, in Africa with uh, development of, of native trees and fruits for, for specialty crops. And but that's also based on coming really from a demand from small farmers who who are, who are looking for this and demanding. And so some of the research efforts led w with by Ecraft and Roger Leakey in, in developing uh, uh, and, and, and selection of improved uh, varieties of, of, of native tree crops like the, the bush mango or the uh, pr um, African uh, uh, plum and, and, and some others. Um, but in the United States, we face a lot of challenges. One is, is, the, is sort of the, the policy environment and, and the subsidy structure of subsidies. That has a lot to do. But despite you know us as agroforesters thinking we have you know great great and compelling evidence, good data, but we've not achieved significant impacts in terms of adoption. And part of that is is our own failing in terms of either whether communicating that or translating that into you know, effective outreach. But certainly the the policy environment and and the subsidies have a tremendous uh, uh, influence as well. And so increasingly we in the our association for agroforestry, the North American or the Association for Temporary Agroforestry are really, uh, in the last year or two, are really uh, coming to the, the consensus that we really need to have a more, much more active role in, in policy uh, recommendations and advocacy and advocating for um, uh, more favorable policies and, uh, and supports for agroforestry, like what we've seen in, 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 in the successful uh, accomplishments in Europe in, in just a few year, short years uh, since URAF, uh, the European Agroforestry Association, was founded a mere five or six years ago, and there's been tremendous progress. But uh, you, you, I mean, quite rightly, from some of the uh, uh, things that you, you you made mention of. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for for participating. I'm, I'm thanks. I should uh, thank some of the folks. I now I should mention I'm not a researcher. I'm an outreach coordinator, so I'm not citing original research here, but research from some others in our center. So I'd like to thank uh, some of the researchers, uh, Shibu Joes at the Center for Agroforestry and Dennis Garrity at the World Agroforestry Center, upon whose work I've based uh, and, and previous some of their presentations that I've based this presentation. So thank you so much for being here.